Larson and Carla Zimonia. Did you know you were going to be famous chiefly for Nina Jones? I didn't know that. I don't know. Like, I, I, I think I start arguments because I always say right out of the bat, like, you know, that Indiana Jones movie is the best one, and loads of people disagree with me. They're always like, no, Temple of Doom is the best one. Know. And, you know, they're always like, oh, Crusade is my favorite because Sean Connery, yeah. etc. And I'm just like, you're all wrong, because the bolder moment in the in the Raiders beginning is probably the best movie moment of all time. Yeah. So you can all shut up. <laughs> um, so I think today uh, what we're going to do is that me and Carla have had these fireside chats a lot. Um, and so uh, we were thinking if any of you actually f uh, have a question whilst we're talking to each other, uh, just to wave, stick up your hand uh, and wave at us. You, which is um, and yeah, uh, oh, some lights oh, wow. up, hooray. Wow. Um, and if you have a question for us, uh, just like wave at us and we can include it in whatever we're talking about. Um, so yeah, so that would be handy for us. So yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so I was going to ask you uh, as an opener, uh, how do you feel about Gone Home now that you've got some distance from it? Uh, fun. <laughs> Are you rich now? No. Well, also we're running a we're we started a, a new company to do a new game and everything that I made personally is going to that. So right. No. So you're but, reinvesting. Yes. And yeah. it's also real creepy because like people now depend upon us for their livelihoods and stuff. So I'm all like. Is that scary? It's really weird. <laughs> it's know, weird. Yeah. It's very strange. It's weird. I mean, it's like super grown up. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess running your own company is. Terrifying. It's kind of alarming, but um, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully, it'll work out. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pleased about it. It seems like it was a long time ago at this point. Hey, what's up? Did everybody from the original Fulbright move over to the new company? The question was, uh, did everyone from the original Fulbright uh, company move over to the new one? Um, the answer is most, not all. Okay. Because mm -hmm. um, Kate moved. Didn't, did she? She moved. She moved away, but she was always remote. So. Oh okay. Yeah. So she. She wanted to move back to Ontario and move around her family. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that is cool. Have there have there been any surprising reactions to Got Home that you that you were surprised about? I don't know. Um, gosh, let's see. Apart from like universal adoration. Well, I mean, there's always like horrible assholes. You know? Horrible assholes. Cases, yeah. How could you be an asshole about Got Home? Well, actually, don't answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Oh, the, I think the best, uh, the best diss we got was something like, um, uh, if I wanted to read a book, I'd read a book. At least there were lesbians. <laughs> something like that. Really? <laughs> yes. It was pretty good. Wow. Um, I think it was something like that. At least there were lesbians. At least. I think that's something I can say about all media. Yeah. I mean, there aren't really that many lesbians in video games. There aren't. It's kind of. Well, I mean, when they are, they're like you know. For sure. Yeah, they're like Jake right. Newcomb lesbians. Right. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite acts of, um, and I'm just gonna start rambling again. One of my, <laughs> my favorite acts of graffiti that I have done is uh, non destructive. Um, we had a, at Two Kim Ren, we had a, somebody had a big cardboard stand up thing of Duke Nukem with the hole cut up for his head so that you could, you know, come in and be Duke Nukem and they were like, you know, whatever, like girls in, um, well, schoolgirl outfits, like next to or whatever, and looking all excited about her. Oh no, there's only one girl. And so I saw this and I was like, all right, I'm gonna ruin this. I'm gonna ruin the fun for everyone. And I got a whole bunch of post-its and I started having conversations between Duke Nukem and the lady. And they were like, it, from the viewpoint, pretending that they were in like a really long-term relationship and sometimes things were difficult. And like, <laughs> and so like, you know, I was all like, you know, we know how to talk out our differences and like, you know, stuff like that. And just being really like positive, but like, trying to point out how weird it was, um, and they left it up for a really long time, <laughs> and I was really happy about it. Where, where was this? It was at 2K. Oh, um, really? Yeah, I went over to 2K room. Nice. Because, you know, it's like the same parent company or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's why we had to look at that. Do you miss working for, like, a massive no. company <laughs> at all? No, I totally don't. No, no. You wouldn't even, like, miss, like, office environments, etc. No, no, it's, like, not 
great. I don't know. It's it's fine. It's, it has good things about it, but I think that right now I, I don't even think I'd know how to work with like a team that was like you know 100 people or whatever. Like you, you worked at um at Rockstar. What did, I mean, like how do you feel about it? Well, when I worked at Rockstar, I mean it's weird because like I guess. AAA offices these days have that big like open plan, yeah. you know, thing yeah. where they're like everyone should be able to lean over the computer and then ask someone else a question. But actually, it just I feel like it makes people hide a lot from each other, and like it's also it's not as like kind of progressive open thinking like blue sky thinking as everyone thinks it is. So it's kind of weird because everyone tries to sort of shy away from each other. So I don't feel like it's actually that like you know productive at all, but. Yeah, Rockstar was kind of interesting just because it was so intense as an experience and I felt like even if we weren't in crunch a lot of the time, we were actually in crunch, you know what I mean? So it's kind of a pressurized environment in which everyone's trying to claw back something for themselves and it can be quite stressful. So yeah, I certainly don't really miss AAA at all. <laughs> I feel like you can definitely like make yourself work that hard without some manager having to do it for you. Yeah, I think I think that's what is great about um, indie games in particular is that you are your own boss a lot of the time and that you can set your own goals and I mean there's a lot, it's really weird because like the past year I've just been traveling around the world writing about game developers, indie game developers and a lot of the time, I know it's kind of Mary suing the whole thing, but I felt like I had a lot in common with people who make games from their houses simply like being a freelance writer because we have like lots of things in common like we overwork ourselves like we'll, we'll basically work into the middle of the night and then realize oh shit I haven't eaten anything and I haven't drunk anything and like I haven't seen another human being all day and like all I've got to show are these words I'm going to put on the internet and it's the same for an indie game developer you're sitting here all day and you're just going to have like a game at the end that you publish on the internet and that's that's what it is and yeah so I, I started to kind of I really identified with a lot of the stuff that people were going through whilst making their game uh, not that I haven't made games of my own but it's also kind of like now I specifically do words I guess yeah I don't know do you have do you feel like you have like a healthy a healthy working atmosphere at Fulbright? Uh, mostly um we definitely get like we definitely overdo it sometimes, but it's not that bad. Um, I definitely like. I have a cat now. I have to go take care of a cat. <laughs> Did you see the amazing article that Keith, uh, the Guardian, wrote about cats of game development? No, I don't think so. This is a really amazing article. He just asked everyone he could about their cats. Like, are you a game developer? Do you have a cat? Yes, you qualify for this article. <laughs> Quick, let's put pictures of cats. So yeah, he wrote that all oh, it, it was pretty great. But yeah, what is it about game developers and cats? I don't know. I, sus a cat? I suspect it's because they're not like as schedule driven as dogs. Like you know, dogs you have to you have to be like take this dog out every six hours or else. Yeah. Um, whereas cats do not have like. So basically, what you're saying is that game developers don't like to go outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an indoor person. I need to have a cat. <laughs> It's true. No matter what pose they are, they're like fucking adorable. <laughs> <laughs> they're like licking their assholes. Like, they're, like, they're adorable and they lick their assholes is what I picked up from that. So I feel like cats do do that. Yeah. Is that is that how is that how they're similar to the game developers? <laughs> <laughs> nice. He said they're good to have around because of that, which is true. Yeah. It's entertaining. Dark. They are entertaining. Um, I do want to ask a question. No, the themes of the article was that cats do what they want and game developers do what they want. They don't mm. really care. Yeah. That's what I just thought of the end Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do both do what they want. That is true. Do you do what you want? Yeah, are there things are there games that you want to make that you haven't already made? Uh I don't maybe. Um jeez. It's I don't really want to get super hung up on that, especially at the beginning of a cycle yeah. because yeah. I will feel like garbage till the end of the whole thing and that's like a year and so I'm then like, man, I don't want to go like if only I could be a bad thing when I'm trying to make a thing. So is it exciting in the beginning of like a new game 
where nothing has been like really nailed down because you, you're now working on Tacoma. Yeah. Um, so like, is it super exciting to just be there at the beginning of that and like, as you look out upon the future, be like. So when you're like only a few people in charge of something, a game you're making, it's actually terrifying at the beginning uh -oh. because there are so many ways to fuck it up structurally. Yeah. Even from the very beginning. Yeah. And so trying to avoid all those problems and trying to plan for problems to come up and stuff like that is kind of alarming sometimes. For, yeah. Maybe that's just me, but. <laughs> no, I get that. Um, because I guess, you know, when you've worked on a thing, the risk is when you've when you've put so much time in uh, into your game that you've gone down the road that shouldn't have been travelled, you know, and then you end up having to commit to this thing right. that you've done and you can't redo it unless you Valve and it's Half Life One and you have infinite money and, and you have infinite money, money and or else unless you have like uh, you know someone who's producing your um, or publishing you and they're all like, well, we'll give you money for another six months to fix it or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's not gonna happen for us, so yeah. Uh, so we better not do that. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Um, this is a dumb question already. Uh, what is the coolest like food experience you had while traveling all over everything last year? Oh my god, this is a really good question because I had so many really great things to eat. So I was in Malaysia and I was staying um, with Cassandra Ka, who is also a journalist. She lives in Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. And I was writing about Sean Beck, and Sean Beck took me to this place um, for Nasi Lemak, which is coconut fragrant rice and um, deep fried chicken, and the batter is like a special batter. And then it's served with like this particular chili sauce. And he took me to the best place in uh, Kuala Lumpur to get Nasi Lemak. And it was probably the best thing I've ever put in my mouth, ever. Um, it's super good. It was like ridiculously good. It was like the the rice was like honestly the most amazing like like fragrant sort of like soft like super great rice. And then there was like this like really crispy chicken and like juicy chicken. It was so good. It was beautiful and like the chili sauce was amazing and just the whole thing was like the perfect meal. And like, I swear to God, the Kuala Lumpur is like probably the best food city in the world. I think yeah. it was really, really good. It's really making me go there. It's so good. It sounds really important. But yeah. Um, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. What is the guest best experience about food that you've had in games, or what is the best thing? Ooh. Yeah. Ooh okay. Game about food. Game about food. Interesting. Yeah. I I know that there must be some, but like nothing comes to mind right now. There's a lot of like sh there's a lot of like things that you can refer to easily. Like I'm always you know if you're eating like a protein bar or something, you're always like let's get the soy food, you know, or whatever. And like there's always things you can think about, but like yeah, I don't know what's impressive. But actually, stepping on the dog food in Wolfenstein is pretty good when it comes to food experiences. I I was a fan. Of Steve that. was telling me about Wolf the new Wolfenstein. Oh, I played the new one. This oh no. One. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, someone was telling me that I think it was Steve who was telling me about the new Wolfenstein yeah, New Order. Yeah. He said it, he said it was really good. Yeah. Steve Gaynor, sorry. Or at least um, point. Yeah, and, uh, because it has a part in it in which the main character falls in love with this this woman, and they have like actual mature a mature sexual relationship with each other all, right. all the way through the game. I confess, I'm surprised. Yeah. I mean, it's the kind of game where you like you think that's not gonna happen. Right, you think Duke Nukem with head cut out. Yeah, yeah, you really like Duke Nukem yeah. from like, yeah, I'm just screw this yeah. girl, we're never gonna see her again. Actually, they have a really adult relationship. They sleep together, they wake up the next morning. This is the thing that really surprised me about this game, is that they wake up the next morning. It's not just a cutscene where they've like fucked each other yeah. and then that's it. Like the next morning they wake and, you, and like, you know, you're playing this, what's his name? Uh, Blaskowitz, that's his name. And like he wakes, wakes up next to her, and like you're you're looking at her, and you're like, it's the next morning. Whoa! Like and it's like mind blowing. It's like it's time, time time went on, and they're like she's still there. She's not a figment of his imagination. And then they also like have sex later in the game again. And I was like, what the heck is this? It's fine. What the? That's amazing. Wait, so the narrative. Amazing. Wait, so the protagonist <laughs> is Polish? Uh, I was with an like that? Possibly. 
I mean, that would be rad. I mean, it, it, like Wolfenstein, the, like the main character's name is always being B. J. Blazkowicz, isn't that? I don't remember. Polish and Arab. Polish and Arab. Well, in that case. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was so surprised by it. I was like, what the heck? Um, so, yeah. I mean, have you ever been tempted to do that in a game? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I could um, look into that. Do sexy times in your game? I mean, maybe, um, that may occur. Um, I, mm, I don't know. I feel like I haven't, I haven't studied that enough to, like, you haven't studied sex enough? No, I need to do more. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do some homework today. <laughs> Sweet. Um, uh, I guess like media depictions are always sort of weird, and I feel like I wouldn't necessarily be able to do a better job. And I'm, I'm, yeah. I, could, I would have to work on it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, we're talking about food, weren't we? It's fine, you know, whatever. I feel like Cooking Mama is a really great game. I had a kind of good time with it for a little while. I think it was up. <laughs> Everyone wants to add. Do you want to prolong the sexy times yeah, talk? Have you heard about the list? It's a game jam about sex. It's a, I think it's in Denmark. Oh. Uh, I think it's a really cool project, and I think they're going to do a second edition sometime this year. That sounds cool. It's spelled L Y S T. List. Yeah. And yeah. where is it? List. I think it's in Copenhagen. Like in Copenhagen. Red. Okay. Cool. It sounds great. Uh, send me an invitation. <laughs> Might have something to say, I don't know. Uh, yeah. You can pull it off. Yeah. Bye. Oh yes, I am bread. Have you played I am bread? I haven't played it either. And you're like, yeah, piece of like a slice of bread. And then you're supposed to get a to toaster. Is that is that it? Like, that sounds amazing to me. Where you know, like how if you if you have some toast and they've got butter at the top, yeah. then you accidentally flip it off the table, it always lands butter side down. So like, okay, butter's heavier than not butter. That's true. <laughs> so, but like, what? <laughs> so like, business. <laughs> Buttering the wrong side. <laughs> Why do we butter both sides and then do the experiment? Or push <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that, yes. The, I think it wasn't a far side cartoon, was it? Or something? I don't know. The whole thing with the cat. And yeah. The, yeah, and butter bread on the other side, and just perpetual motion machine or something. Yeah. Sort of cute. Wasn't that in Moon Rock? Wasn't that what? Wasn't it Moon Rock? I don't know, I, I got this idea that it's in Futurama, but I'm not mm. totally sure. Oh, yeah. The only thing I can remember like, regarding food with Futurama is um, that bit where they, he eats the truck stop sandwich. Yeah. The terrible egg salad truck stop sandwich, and then like a whole host of like little organisms start to make like build stuff in his gut, and then they make him really smart, and then eventually he realizes he's gonna die or something because they're all like dying. Anyway, they destroy. Yeah, as always. Um, yeah. sci-fi troops. So, right. I'll yeah, I'll ask you something. I'll ask, ask, ask. All right, ask. I got something. All right. So, oh. Oh. which is about sex. Um, it's actually about the first time that Nina had sex, which was um, with um, someone she met on an MMO. And um, yeah, and she told me like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go and work at Fulbright. And I was like, what? 
uh, and then I couldn't tell anyone for months. It was like excruciating. Um, but yeah, like I feel like Nina, Nina just, it's not that she likes to talk about or make games about sex in particular, but she likes to tell very personal stories. And I think that's probably one of like the like things that Fulbright is really good at. I think would be really good at. So I feel like that would fit in. But Nina's like primarily designer programmer, isn't she? Yes, but I mean, she also knows how to write and stuff. You know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Are you excited? Like, has she started yet? Yeah. She yeah. just started like um, it was like last week or something. Yeah. Okay. Until we just just moved over there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's gonna be great. I'm glad to have her. Cool. You're all glad to have her. It's yeah. Cool. When did you like? When did you start thinking, oh, we need an extra person? Well, I think it was more than just we wanted to hire Nina. Um, it was actually really funny because um, when Steve first met her, he met her like a year after I first met her, and I just went to some like, thing in some, it might have been an Indicate thing in New York like, a couple years ago or something. Um, and I met her, and we were just kind of like, oh, it was cool. And, she, and I went and looked up her games afterwards, and I was like, oh, these are really charming. And like, I don't know, whatever, some later point, like, Steve met her at like GC or something. Um, maybe, no, it can't have been. Maybe it was GC like two years ago or something, one year ago. Anyway, and he came back and he was all like, if you play, how do you do it? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, okay. And like, I went back and, and we, um, you know, do you know Nina? Do you know everything? I was like, yeah, she's cool, whatever. And he was just kind of like, we should probably hire her. And I was like, Good idea. Okay, so tell tell me a little bit about what you like about how do you do it. Um, Explain to the audience what, what how do you do it is about. I mean, I don't know. I feel like it's a really um, relatable um, depiction of how you don't know anything when you're a kid, and it, it helps to kind of bring you back to that um, situation you just because you can't really do much, and yeah. you're like, yeah, this is weird and hard, and it doesn't make any sense. Um, so like, it's a game about. Um, if you've never played yeah. it, it's a game about, uh, so Nina, <laughs> Nina told me the story about like how she went to go and see Titanic when she was 12, and she didn't understand what happened in the steamy car. <laughs> and she was pretty much trying to figure this out when she was 12. Any other movie, you'd be like, horror scene. Yes, yeah. Like, and she's being eaten. Yeah, uh, and like, she's like, why are the fingers, like, what's happening in there? Why, why are they naked? They don't have any clothes on. How does, like, how do the parts work, sort of thing? And so how do you do it is essentially like she's been left alone in a room by her mother and she's got like this Barbie doll and a Ken doll basically and the idea is that she's got to make them do it as many times as she possibly can before her mom comes back. Um, and so it's like basically just like ram these two bodies. Like, also they don't have any genitals because right. they're dolls. Right. And Completely ram. arbitrarily. Like, yeah. Just like, like cram, you know, just heads into each other's like yeah. faces or whatever. <laughs> and then like at the end they'll come up with a score. Of like, you've probably done it ninety times. You know, like it's just a made-up score. But yeah, I don't, even, I don't even know how the score is calculated. I don't know either. I'm not sure whether it's totally arbitrary or whether it's just like, um, you know, intersection, like physics intersection. Yeah, maybe it's like how many yeah. physics happen yeah, to hits. Yeah, I don't know. Or, yeah. Um, but the expression on the there's the picture of the little girl in the background, like while she's doing this, and she's just look at this like, yes, yeah, what? Like, what is going on? on? And like, and sometimes like she. You know, like yeah. just to get their legs together or something, and goes, oh, oh, I'm, I'm really doing it here. You know, like, it's kind of weird though, but it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Being a kid sucks. Yeah. <laughs> but I really love how, you know, she just has these ideas um, that, that come like straight from her childhood or straight from very personal experiences, and she's a designer that really knows how to like portray. Like, people will often separate our narrative from, you know, like mechanical design of a game sort of thing, when actually I feel like they both are like, you know, they both feed into each other, they're symbiotic, they're yeah. just, um, there's no real binary there, and so I think that she's fantastic at like showing that, and all of her games are pretty much just like, this is a situation I got into, this is how you play around with it, um, she's that's really great. She's really amazing about just kind of like scoping down so that like she has a concept to get across, and that concept gets across through interaction, and yeah. it's like, it's just... She's really good at uh, narrowing her focus. Yeah. That's how I would put it. And I know that most people probably have played Civil because. Civil so because. It's not really out yet. It's not <laughs> out. Yeah. Uh, but Civil is in the IDF, I think. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to talk about it a little bit. Um, and so Civil is, like, it's got a lot of, like, um, 
been uh, lo lots of voiceover work because it's basically about the experience of playing with another person in an MMO, except the other person in, in the game obviously is an AI. And the AI has like this voice of this guy who you're talking to who's trying to flirt with you and it's really uncomfortable. It makes you feel like really blushy and like very kind of like, oh my god, like he's trying to seduce me. He's trying to seduce me. Um, and so it's all this like kind of like, and your job is to basically like uh, navigate this um, this space um, and like kill all these monsters along with this other in the MMO. In the MMO. Yes. And um, and yeah, and it's like really interesting because like the the like the fact that it's being narrated by both of you, like your voice, which is voiced by Nina, which is really weird, especially for Nina, and then this other guy. Um, she depicts herself in other ways too. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, and um, yeah, it's like a really interesting experience because essentially this like voiceover is like putting this other layer on what's otherwise a very mechanical sort of like very kind of perfunctory like kill this monster okay it's dead okay kill this next monster and it's like it's put this like extra layer on that's like really makes you feel like oh my god there's so much time right now well it's interesting just kind of like shift to focus just because it's the mmo is the ground upon which like this relationship happens it's not the whole point of it is not like you know how they interact while you know playing necessarily because i that would be awful, um, but like <clears throat> that would be really hard. But so yeah, it's mostly just kind of like here's something you do while this relationship occurs, and you get to I don't know, it's, it gives you something else to think about without making it really universally hard. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like you're playing two games at once, like with each hand or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I really like it. So anyway, I'm excited about Civil, so you should definitely look it up. Um, I think you can put your knit, like email on an email list to get notified um, yeah. about it when it comes out. But yes, it's very, it's super great. And Nina made, made that with her boyfriend, Emmett. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so Nina's great. I guess we've established. That's true. Well, I mean, you know, yeah. it's purple. She also made me get purple hair when I went to New York. So oh, that's actually, that. she instigated the she's hair she's color change. Purple hair. It's pretty good. good. It's good. It's really good. Um, are there any other questions? You were going to ask me a question. Yeah, I was. I have, I have like a few questions queued up, and one of them is favorite voice song. Or album. Favorite Bowie song? Or album, if you can't do something. I have this really, really big obsession with the song Golden Years. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I don't really know really why. I think it's probably because I think of Bowie by Golden Years a lot as being like the best Bowie song, but I know that so many people disagree with me because it's, it's not the most interesting song. It's fine, you're allowed. Yeah. <laughs> you can pick whatever you want. Yeah. How about you? How about you? Uh, I don't know. What were you going to say? Bowie or Drake? Bowie or Drake? <laughs> I'm the one who loves Bowie. She's the one who loves Drake. I love that everyone, all that anyone takes away from my Twitter feed is that I really love Drake. No, I took away from the song earlier. Oh, really? <laughs> um, I do love Drake a lot. In fact, I brought a Drake t-shirt with me um, on my travels. Uh, so, well yeah. Um, I think, musically, <laughs> uh, Bowie is is uh, definitely better than Drake. However, I think in terms of, so I really like the way that Drake uses language because I'm a writer and that's how I work. And I think rap is incredibly useful as a writer simply because rappers use language um, and sounds and like consonant sounds in particular um, and rhythm incredibly well. And I think that when people talk, when people talk about um, literature, I think that people are very unaware of the fact that way back in the midst of time, all we used to do was like tell each other stories in an oral tradition instead of writing them down. And so actually, when when you consider narrative I, and and the, and the way that our language functions now, I think what we're doing is really participating in this like kind of oral tradition. And I think that rap is actually this incredibly uh, incredible medium that actually is furthering our the way the way that our language it functions now, and and I think it's only undervalued because people think of it as being like uh, I think it's like kind of slightly racist in terms of that people try to like make it outside of culture a lot and say that it's like thuggish or whatever when I actually think it's like one of like the most interesting uh, ways to express yourself. So I think actually. Um, I think rap is like probably um, 
one of the things I'm most interested in just now. Um, I think it's like an incredible uh, way to express yourself, and I think it's like very useful to me as a writer. So yeah, um, yeah. I don't know if you have any, any opinions on rap music. Uh, I'm like kind of out of touch, but I used to listen to David Soul a lot. They're good. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, because I'm white, I like the Beastie Boys. Um, oh but, yeah. No, I like the Beastie Boys. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. I haven't really paid attention to it super much lately. I mean, I think, I mean, recommend? sorry? What do you recommend? What do I recommend? Um, so I love Missy Elliott. Oh if yeah, you, she's great. Yes, yeah, so if, you haven't, if you haven't heard any Missy Elliott, she's wonderful. I do enjoy her. Um, I really recommend the verse that Nicki Minaj does in Monster. Nice. <laughs> and none mm -hmm. of the rest of that track. Right. Um, <laughs> no, I, no, there's, um, I, I, I think there is def there's definitely, um, I feel like Drake's era is interesting simply because he is half R&B and mm -hmm. half rap, I would say. Sure. And in the beginning of his career, he did a lot of auto-tuning, which I'm not into. Um, but he's got way, way better. Like, anything Kanye does is great. So like, okay, so when, they, when you say half R&B and half rap, do they yeah. like switch back and forth? Do they infuse one with the other? Well, so I'm used to like K-pop like stuff, that like where there's like a person <laughs> singing and a person rapping and stuff like that, and sometimes it's even a different dude. Yeah. Um, yeah, and whatever, so like, yeah, I've noticed that. Is yeah. That thing, or? So I would say that when I say that Drake is more R&B, I think it's probably because there are sections where he actually sings. Okay. He's a very good singer. Yeah. And so he actually will serve you a bit of crooning and such. Was that how he started singing and then someone was like, you should totally actually rap? I think, yeah, he started off, well, he started off like, you know, putting together samples and beats and, and that sort of thing. And he did this, so my favorite track that Drake's ever done is, has, it was really early on in his career where he did like this mixtape thing. And he did like a Drake, like a, a remix of himself singing on a Lickily. Is that how you pronounce it? Lickily? Oh, the track? Lickily. Licky, yeah, Licky it's, it's and um, and if she, they, he remixed a little bit, mm -hmm. and it's probably my favorite Drake track, even though he is a rapper, and it's it's just him singing, um, and it's really really good. So I recommend looking up that. I think it's actually on YouTube. Um, it's kind of rare and hard to find. But it's on YouTube. Um, so I super like that one song. But yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, yes, so we're talking about rap a lot. Is there anyone? Oh, uh, oh actually, uh, oh, you have an no, answer question. Cool. You have an answer question, yeah, so. Okay, uh, so are there any interesting subjects or themes um, you feel that games haven't covered yet that they should? Interesting subjects or themes that games haven't covered yet that they should? Probably shit ton. I mean, there's a lot. I think, I think to a certain extent, um, there's a whole host of like human things that games haven't really covered because up until now all we've been doing is like you know platformers and puzzlers and you know like uh, first person shooters and like there are only so many things that you can wrap around those particular functions. Do you know what I mean? And so you can't really. I mean, there's been like a, there was a, I heard about this game recently called First Person Lover. <laughs> first Person That's Lover. Cool. And it's essentially like uh, a first person shooter where instead of like shooting people, you make people fall in love with you or something. Mm -hmm. And it's all like rainbow colors and lovely and like, and I'm just like, that's really adorable. Or yeah, you, know, you make people fall in love with each other, I think. So you make, if you're like a kind of Cupid character and it makes them like naked or something, or I don't even know. <laughs> but yeah, and I'm just like, wow, that's how people fall in love. No, <laughs> but like, uh, so, but yeah, like it's kind of just what it, I guess what it reveals is that that's a kind of clumsy, like you can't tie a, a narrative like that around almost. Yeah, anything, I guess yeah. like yeah, the thing that I would say to that first is just that a lot of people seem to behave as if games need to be structured around major conflict and like you know minor conflict and things that are just sort of more exploratory are often not as popular with people who are really into shooters. So, um, you know, it, there are obviously a lot of ways to go, but not in the existing um, AAA paradigm, necessarily. Um, although I'm sure that they will get the hang of it before, you know, the sun burns out <laughs> and get there at some point, but not right now. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think... 
So I, the thing is, like, all the, there are a bunch of games that are being made right now for free uh, with free tools on the internet. Like, there are a million of them, and they are all addressing really unusual, weird topics. Like, I'm sure I played a twine game about devil worshipping, and I'm sure I played a twine game about rape, and I'm sure I played a twine game about, like, a bunch of topics that are all very human and very, you know, that probably first-person shooters could never ever address. And the thing is, like, people are making these games all the time, but the thing is, just because they're not PR'd up to the eyeballs, and because they're, they're not expensive to make... No, you know, low production values, you know, not, there's no fancy graphics. Yeah, at all. yeah, yeah. That, the re that the reason you're not hearing about them is because we don't write about them, because, like, firstly, they don't get sent to us, secondly, like, no one knows that they you know, they exist because we have to go out there and find them. And they're free, so there's no money to be made. People. There's no money to be made, um, so yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I guess. Hmm. It is good for people to be, I don't know, yeah, it's also one of those things where games uh, have a long dev cycle. Like, even if you are, like, no matter what size you are, like, you can't just make a game in, and you can make a game in an afternoon, people do it in jams. I would hate to do that, I would be really bad at it. But um, it is generally a long process. Like it's it's sort of like, I don't know, it's as if um, it's like it's like make, almost like making a movie or something, and it's just, you know, movies can come out a lot because there are a lot of movie studios. We don't have that many that are big. We don't have that many big studios just like throwing things out constantly. So I mean yeah, we just we have lower radar things that are coming out often and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people just don't know how to look for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I personally am like part of a big push by, uh, I guess, games journalists to cover free games. Like, I think that that's one thing that we could do much better at because really what I want to get out of doing is like covering only the games that are coming out for like big bucks. Because I don't really like this idea that like their games are products because I think it just kind of destroys our, our view of games in general. It's like kind of damaging to think about them as just like, a thing that comes out of a process and then we buy it like it's a hair dryer or like a, an appliance of some sort and like five out of ten you know and I, I think that's somewhat devaluing what it is that we do in general um i don't necessarily think, I think i'm saying anything controversial to you guys but if i said it like maybe at gdc someone might throw something at me yeah it's certainly if you said it dice they the would dice. flip the fuck out yeah but like yeah i mean it's it's like uh, hollywood in a lot of ways where they're just kind of like well we, we have to make this certain you know it has to make this particular return yes so we're going to make everything right down the middle that we know that we are hitting our demographic points with and yeah like we did the same thing yeah and like it's really boring <laughs> it's dull because you, it means you can't take any risks right like the most exciting games of like the past two years that have come out of the indie sphere like They've been like games that I feel like have made uh, taking risks and been like really interesting and like to a certain extent even Minecraft was like a huge risk and you know it's only just sort of it's paid off because literally it's like video game Lego but I mean who wouldn't like that game right. but, but you can't take risks when you're in the entire fate of your company is that it's billions of dollars is resting on it absolutely you know? and that's why so, okay. we keep getting GTA's and yes, uh, you know. Assassin's Creed is because they know people will buy it. Um, Speaking of taking risks, uh, that brings me yeah. to something that I've been dying to ask a football company. Oh. Um, um, Carla, uh, in the special play, um, the fullback company refused to go to PAX. Correct. Uh, and that was a decision that I've never heard any other developer taking in like a similar kind of way. And the reasons for that were made pretty clear in the blog post, mm -hmm. but what could you maybe elaborate a bit on the risk-taking part of, of, of that decision? Like you were kind of um, saying, okay, we were we are um, accepting that we will lose a huge yeah. potential audience yeah. for doing such a step, and we will not only do it silently, but we will have, we will put a voice behind it. Um, what 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 was going on with the company then? Like how how did you come to that decision? How do you stand by it now? Did y'all hear that? Or okay. Um, well, Maybe see. explain it better because I don't you, think you did that. fine. Um, yeah, I mean, really, the only hit that we took from that is potential imaginary lost sales. I mean, which you know is lousy, and a lot of people can't afford to do things like that. Like they have to go because they're like, my living requires that I make you know X amount, and I barely make X amount if I go to all these you know um, uh, conferences and put myself out there and that obviously sucks and they have to do it, they have no choice. Um, and we were lucky enough that we were 
aiming low, our costs were low, we were all like living in the same house, and so to cut costs like in Oregon, so it was like the cheapest possible thing. Um, and we just did not have a whole lot of outlay, we just had to like, you know, not burn everything immediately. Um, and so we were able to, you know, make that decision, which a lot of people don't have the opportunity, and we were like, I these people are awful, like, you know, they've, they've shaped, they seem to have shaped up a little bit, but I, um, I hesitate to say on the record that I thought they were improving a lot. Um, they, um, they just seemed really ghastly, and we were like, we cannot put us, ourselves, or anything we make near that, because it just seems like the worst. And I, we, we just felt like if we had gone to it, we would be letting down so many people. And you know, it's kind of like you know, when you when you show up to something and you um, show at it, you're kind of you're kind of aligning align yourself with it in a lot of ways. Like you're kind of being like, you know, this I will put my arm around this entity, and we'll be friends for a little while in front of the cameras. And like, if it's something that you don't believe in and are not down with their pattern of thinking, maybe it's best that you don't do that, if you can. Um, but yeah, we just did not think that we were to, we didn't want to be a part of that, and so we had to like nicely say it, cause, so that maybe some other people would um, not feel that they had to, but that's, you know, your own decision and everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's a hard decision to make, I think. Um, because sometimes, you know, as a freelance writer, I find myself thinking, you know, I, I could make I could make more money if I wrote for this particular outlet, say, uh, and put my work on that website. But like the problem is, like sometimes, say, a website might publish something that you don't really agree with, and that they have like a kind of company policy, like. I know Thought Catalog recently has like published some really awful, <laughs> offensive stuff. And a lot of the time, like I feel like I would, you know, even if I really needed the money, I wouldn't put my writing on that website because it would give that website traffic, or like it would basically be like I was endorsing that website. And like I feel like that's a kind of similar thing where like it's a privilege to be able to say actually I'm not, I, you know, I don't need that money today. Um, I don't, I don't feel like I want to endorse that person or that thing or that company. Sometimes you just have to do Sometimes it. Sometimes you do have to do it, though. And it is, you have, you're not yeah, there. and there are probably a ton of people, a ton of indies who, who did go to PAX because they really needed to, Absolutely. because they needed yeah. to meet their audience, they needed yeah. to meet people and say that something about their game. Um, yeah, but I think it's, did, but yeah. yeah, and I think that it's really, it was, but it was really good of you to put up a blog post because, I mean, I feel like there probably were some people who just needed supporting in that way, like, yeah. like to know that they could do that and yeah. not go, you know, and, yeah. yeah. So yes, yeah. they were just weirdos and it was awful. And like I, I don't know. Yeah, we like we know enough like marginalized and like trans and people of color and stuff that like just when you see how they treat them, it's just ghastly. I don't know. It's I'm glad that I didn't have to. Yeah, I mean I. Yeah, I mean I don't really. It's it's strange because like I, it's it's a kind of hazard, hazardous place out there where like you know at one point like a company is probably gonna fuck up and do something terrible and you have to decide for yourself whether that's okay with you or not um, because you know often where the money is like people start to be start to forget their responsibilities. Yeah. I think. Well, I think people get used to um, operating at a certain scale and then. Powerful, they don't really realize it. You know, yes. like, just go on like always. And yes. Like, well, you actually carry a lot more weight now. And yeah. The words mean something mean more, and stuff like that. That's it. Like, I mean, I, I, no, but I feel no, I, I feel it with myself as well. It's like as as my readership has grown, I, I, I understand now that I can't be like the garbage human being I used to be, where I, I was like, because I used to be a huge anti-feminist. I used to hate feminists. Oh, I, too. I, I used, shame. yeah, I used to hate women. Yeah. I absolutely did. I yeah. thought. Yeah. I thought I was cool because men liked me, you know, because I thought the feminists were awful. Right, like, I, I was like, I'm going to avoid everything feminine forever, yeah. and just, like, behave like the dudes and everything, and it yeah. was fine, and you know what? I was, like, 20 years old, and I was a fucking idiot. Yeah, and yeah I was just a dick to women, yeah. and it was, like, yeah. it really alienated me from women, and, like, men 
thought it was fine, but women were just not okay with it. And I started to realize, actually, you can't be that person anymore um, because actually you're just treating other people terribly. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, so I think as, as you under, grow to understand that you have a responsibility to people, you definitely change your behavior. Um, and I think that's a big, that's a big thing for like the internet that talks about it as if I've like drunk the Kool-Aid or whatever. But actually, it's just I've changed into a better human being. Yeah, you drank the good person Kool-Aid. Right, I it's know. Cool. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's one of those things where you know everyone's suspicious of like drinking the Kool-Aid. It's like no, actually, like honestly, I feel like I've grown rather than like you know. Drunk Henny got down. Conspiracy Kool Aid. People love to do that. Okay, wait, there's a dude in the back who's been waiting for a while. Let me get him first. No, what? Okay. Um, what should we talk about? The yes. Uh, any nice questions to finish up? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's fine. Oh, apparently we're out of time. Okay, we're out of time. Okay, we're fine. Cool. Good to talk to you. Yes, nice talking to you too. Great. <laughs> Carla bought me this jumper at the end. I did.